businesses need to be aware of the opportunities and threats from geoeconomic and geopolitical trends. The boundary between global and local is blurring. Just think, for instance, of inner city transportation and the Uber phenomenon. Today, the picture in the geopolitical arena, as it impacts trade, is a veritable tale of two cities. The famous opening line of the Charles Dickens novel, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times, it was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness, well describes what we see. On the one hand, we see areas of dramatic fragmentation, and this was referred to in the previous discussion, and on the other, we see grand initiatives towards integration. The fragmentation and the withdrawal are driven from the US and the UK. The US is acting protectionist. Brexit has the UK and Europe and indeed the whole world confused. And we see elements in other democracies that have turned their governments inward or altered political landscapes in France, Germany, Italy, and Turkey, and in emerging markets like Brazil. The trend towards openness seems to have taken a pause. And the biggest economic rivalry in history is playing out just now, the US-China trade dispute. And this is a factor in any discussion on the Indo-Pacific. With that context, let us take a look at the narrative of the Indo-Pacific. This is an imagined space stretching across two great oceans connected by the Malacca Straits from the west coast of America to the eastern shores of Africa and the Arabian Peninsula. The Indo-Pacific has emerged to the forefront of global geostrategic and economic thinking in recent years. The recent strength of this idea dates in large measure to Prime Minister Abe's articulation of the concept of the confluence of the two seas in his historic speech to the Indian Parliament in June 2007. The ascent of this region in the global worldview has been accelerated by two important trends. First, the shifting strategic equations between China and the United States, as also the revival of the Quad led by Japan, which is a security partnership with India, Australia, and the US as the other three countries. We see the rise of a stronger China under the assertive leadership of President Xi. The United States has also intensified its focus on the region, symbolically underlined by rechristening the US Pacific Command as the Indo-Pacific Command. This is also the region of the world where statecraft, military planning, and trade and economic policy closely intersect and influence one another. Second, by the rise of the region as a global engine of growth, trade, and innovation. This region of the globe accounts for 60% of global GDP and for two-thirds of global growth. At the Shangri-La Dialogue last year, Prime Minister Modi spoke of the three cardinal tenets that should govern political relations and economic activity in the region, freedom, openness, and inclusivity. This translates into the principles of freedom of navigation, rule of law, respect for sovereignty, private enterprise, and open markets. He declared that rules and norms should be based on the consent of all and not the power of the few. India's vision of the Indo-Pacific region as articulated by Prime Minister Modi, is one that is open, stable, secure, and prosperous, informed by the concept of inclusivity rather than by historic legacies of great power rivalry. This vision, informing the Indo-Pacific region, was also articulated by President Trump in a speech at the APEC CEO summit in June 2017. He declared that this region has emerged as a beautiful constellation of nations, each, in its, its, each its own bright star, satellites to none. 
the Japan-America-India trilateral meeting between the two prime ministers and the US president on the sidelines of the G20 summit in June 2019, deliberated on how the current countries in the region can work together to promote better connectivity and infrastructure, as well as to ensure that peace and security are maintained in these waters. And a week from today, on November 4th, an Indo-Pacific business forum will convene in Bangkok on the sidelines of the East Asia Summit. Senior level government and business delegations from the Indo-Pacific countries, led by the US, will discuss how governments and the private sector can work together to unleash the potential in the region. In the Indo-Pacific region, new trade arrangements and economic integration initiatives are taking shape. While the US and the UK are looking inward, as I mentioned, and provoking reversals of market integration, here in Asia, new configurations are on the rise. First, the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership, the CT CPTPP, which came into force at the beginning of 2019. Remember that the Trans-Pacific Partnership, led by the US, would have created the world's largest free trade area. Unfortunately, President Trump pulled down the TPP on his very first day in office in 2017. The other 11 Pacific Rim countries decided to go forward without the US and created the CPTPP that was concluded in March 2018. These countries, including Japan, constitute 13.3% of global GDP. Japan played a central role in guiding the CPTPP's entry into force early, last, early this year. The second, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, the RCEP, encompassing 16 countries, 30% of the world's GDP, and 46% of global population, is set to become the world's largest trading partnership, although there are complex national sensitivities to be addressed before this block becomes a reality. New agreements, though less comprehensive, can be seen in other markets and regions too. In Africa, we are seeing the development of the African continental free trade area. And Japan, which is the world's third largest economy, signed the deal with the European Union, the world's second biggest economic region. And Japan, of course, has also concluded an agreement with the, UK, with the US relating to certain areas of market access. The EU in, ter EU in turn has been signing agreements from Canada to South America's Mercosur nations. Many of these new trade agreements go beyond tariffs. They cover agricultural subsidies, address duplicating, duplicative testing and labeling, allow companies from other countries to bid for government contracts and open up financial and telecommunication sectors. They have small and medium enterprises, which are increasingly becoming the engines of global growth, sell in other countries. They incorporate protections for workers and for intellectual property. And major initiatives aiming at economic integration are taking place. Most significantly, the Belt and Road Initiative led by China. This grand program is viewed through different lenses by the countries of the littoral. There is a desire not to miss out on the opportunities for infrastructure creation that it promises. There are also apprehensions about its impact on national economic sovereignty and sustainability. The US response has been most significantly to view the Indo-Pacific as a continuum to promote trade and connectivity and to protect freedom of navigation. The Indo-Pacific region will drive global growth over the next decades. It is anticipated that in the next 15 years, the world's major economic powers in, chain, in terms of purchasing power parity will be from the Indo-Pacific region. The recalibration of trading relationships is creating new opportunities for countries in this region. For instance, when US firms seek to shift their manufacturing units to less exposed geographies like Vietnam, India, Malaysia, and Bangladesh. Export-dependent economies 
like Singapore, Malaysia, Vietnam, and Thailand, would also stand to gain from the recent shift in trade equations with the US. Therefore, the current trade frictions are also creating direct opportunities for third countries, such as Vietnam, Bangladesh, and Malaysia, and potentially for India. India, with its favorable demographics, a growing economy, and strong leadership, is well positioned as a key stakeholder in the region. India's multi-layered engagements with the US and ASEAN, and its Act Eat East policy are key enablers that aim to achieve a stable, open, and inclusive Indo-Pacific region. The India-Japan partnership, described as one of the most rapidly advancing relationships in Asia, has emerged as a significant factor in the dynamics of the Indo-Pacific region. In fact, it could be regarded as the most function, well-functioning alliance relationship in the Indo-Pacific. This partnership has diversified to include a wide range of interests beyond economic relations, regional cooperation, maritime security, and global climate. This development, in a sense, is heir to a legacy of historic and religious ties dating all the way back to the 8th century of the Christian era. In the late 19th century, inspired by Japanese culture and philosophy, Swami Vivekananda, a philosopher stage sage of India, was a visitor to Japan. Accompanying him on the ship was Jamshedji Tata, the founder of the Tata Business Group. Jamshedji Tata subsequently joined hands with the famous Aichi Shibusawa to launch a direct shipping service between the two countries to compete and challenge European maritime traffic in the Indian Ocean. And that is fast forward 100 years, a transformational development in commercial relations between India and Japan was Suzuki Motor Corporation's investment in the early 1980s that rev revolutionized the automotive sector in India. Today, Japan is the fourth largest investor in India. In addition to the Maruti-Suzuki collaboration becoming a household name in India, the remarkable success of the New Delhi Metro project and the 90 billion US dollar New Delhi Mumbai Industrial Corridor, or DMIC, indicate the future direction of Japanese investment in India. Many of these projects are funded by the Japan Bank for, in, for International Cooperation, JBIC, which is one of the most significant sources of bilateral assistance for India's infrastructure needs. India has also been ranked as one of the most attractive investment destinations in the latest survey of Japanese manufacturing companies conducted by JBIC. Japanese investments in India have also diversified the traditional sectors of auto, industrial, and consumer electronics have been supplemented by investments in financial services, especially in the insurance sector, with players like Tokyo Marine, Sompo Holdings, and Nippon Life Insurance being active investors. Agriculture is another sector which has seen significant interest, with large investments being made in the last three years, led by companies like Sumutomo Chemicals, Yanmar, and Kubota. This is a priority sector for both countries. Real estate is emerging as a new area of collaboration, with Sumitomo Realty and Development committing huge investments in commercial space, and Sumitomo Corporation and Mitsubishi Corporation in the residential segment. Today, over 1,400 Japanese affiliated companies are registered in India. While the signing of the Indo-Japanese Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement in 2011 has progressed interests in strategic convergence and military cooperation, the volume of bilateral trade needs to increase. Such trade between India and Japan has increased only about four times in the last 18 years. It is in the manifest interest of both countries to give more substance to the bilateral economic partnership. Four key areas of collaboration can be seen as emerging. One, infrastructure creation. Both countries are keen to take forward a converging vision on the Indo-Pacific region 
under the Partnership for Quality Infrastructure. In fact, I had led a US delegation to Tokyo in 2015 to discuss the initial contours of the quality infrastructure construct as a springboard to addressing opportunities in ASEAN with high quality Japanese and US offerings. Infrastructure is an area of significant potential in India as well. The Indian infrastructure space is seeing large projects with Japanese assistance. The Shinkansen project connecting Mumbai and Ahmedabad is at the top of this list. Following the successful Delhi Metro project, while the private and public sectors of both countries partnered, the high-profile Shinkansen project, also funded by JBIC, will bring India on the global map of countries possessing high-speed rail. A total of 18 such trains is expected to be imported from Japan. Smart Cities is another ambitious initiative of the current Indian government, given India's rapidly urbanizing population. Japan is a trusted partner at various levels in supporting this transformative endeavor. The Western dedicated freight corridor, as well as infrastructural projects of strategic importance in northeastern India are also being developed with Japanese support. KPMG India and KPMG Japan are proud to be in the middle of all this. These developments advising on various collaborations across sectors with several corporations and government organizations. The focus, the speed of decision making, the adherence to timelines, and the long-term investment commitments in these projects are truly impressive. A second area of convergence for the two countries is joint investments in third countries, especially in Africa. The bilateral relationship between Japan and India is steadily extending to the continents of Africa and Latin America. India is becoming a logical gateway for Japanese companies to look at Africa. India has a long and deep association with various African countries based significantly on the Indian diaspora who have been settled there for over a century. India is a natural partner for Japan in Africa, providing critical experience, local knowledge, cultural connections, and the soft capital of managerial talent and skill sets. Companies like Daikin, Panasonic, Yamaha, and Myanmar are extending their impressive India presence and resources to Africa. Similar principles could hold true for Latin America, where Japan has long had deep associations. Japan can act as a springboard for India to seek enhanced collaborations within the Latin American region. Thus, Japan and India can create new narratives of collaboration at both ends of the Indo-Pacific. Southeast Asia as a region also offers tremendous opportunities for India-Japan cooperation. Japan has made sizable investments in infrastructure in Southeast Asia. A policy stance that converges well with India's Act East narrative. Asian countries like Singapore are supporters of the two nations strengthening ties through joint investments. A third area that has been gaining currency is technology and digital connectivity. The Indo-Pacific region is witnessing an accelerating pace of digital transition, as well as exponential growth of connectivity. The mobile phone has become the primary instrument of access to public as well as private services, to livelihoods, education and empowerment, to better urban living, and even to healthcare. India's web-based startups have attracted Japanese conglomerates, like the SoftBank Group, which completed its single largest investment in 2017, $1.4 billion in the digital payments provider, Paytm, and subsequently invested $2.5 billion in the e-commerce retailer, Flipkart. As Japan creates in Yokohama its own equivalent of Silicon Valley, there are possibilities and opportunities to create linkages and synergies with India, as seen, for instance, in the establishment of Nissan's global digital hub at Tiruvannadapuram in India. Importantly, Indian human resources are being recognized for talent and not just for cost effectiveness. I'm pleased to share that the partnership between KPMG Japan and India 
has been an integral part of the above journey, working on prestigious and critical digital and cyber projects for Japanese banks, corporations, and government departments. Our projects range from Olympics-related security needs to digital payment systems. A fourth area of joint interest is skill development. Skill development forms one of the cornerstones of India-Japan cooperation. Japanese companies in India are participating in the Japan-India Institutes of Manufacturing, a collaborative venture between the governments of India and Japan. Suzuki, Daikin, Yamaha, Toyota, and Hitachi are some companies that took the lead in establishing skill development institutes. A number of government-to-government -government agreements focused on industrial testing centers and joint skilling programs have also been concluded. A case in point, a very important one, is the Technical Intern Training Program of Japan, where Indian workers are trained in Japan. Collaboration in this space could enhance India's global competitiveness by increasing its labor productivity. This, in turn, can help create a societal consensus in favor of opening markets to trade. Thus, the Indo-Japanese relationship is emerging as a pole of stability and progress, anchoring relationships across the Indo-Pacific littoral and providing beneficial spin-offs to other partner nations. In a common quest, to make the Indo-Pacific region a theater of peace, as well as sustainable and inclusive growth, the nations that share the Indo-Pacific littoral would need to focus their efforts around many axes of action, creating environments for ensuring sustainable public-private partnerships for infrastructure creation, addressing trade barriers, incentivizing cross-border energy flows, including migration to cleaner energy, deploying digital technologies for empowerment, creating new financial instruments for fostering development and enabling access to the best technologies. Moreover, the, as the traditional international powers turn inward, as I mentioned early in my remarks, preserving global commercial norms will require countries like Japan and India to raise their voice and influence in the Indo-Pacific. So let me conclude with the hope that all the nations that share the waters of the Pacific and the Indian Oceans can come together to attain our common goal of a peaceful, prosperous, and sustainable future for all its inhabitants who constitute 65% of the global population. Thank you. Thank you very much. 以上をもちまして、午前の。With this, we'd like to conclude the morning session. Thank you very much to all the speakers. Lunch is provided on the third floor called Fujinoma room. Could you please take your belongings with you? Please put your receivers on your desks. And we have some exhibitions outside of this room. We have booths 